Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast. I'm Tom Keen, along with Paul Sweeney. Join us each day for insight from the best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. You can also watch the show live on YouTube. Visit the Bloomberg Podcast channel on YouTube to see the show weekday mornings from 7 to 10 a.m. Eastern from our global headquarters in New York City. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen. And always on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business App. An inflation report coming to you right now from across America. I'm waiting for the data, particularly on that critical three-tenths of a percent data. And it comes in a little elevated away from the free lunch people were talking about. Instead of 0.3, it's 0.4. Year over year, not 3.4, it's a lofty 3.5. And the big one, the wild search to me, Paul Sweeney, is 3.7 core year over year. Comes out at a 3.8 with a spirited real average hourly earnings. The markets react. S&P 500 just ticks down pretty solidly, down seven tenths of one percent. The Nasdaq off about nine tenths of one percent right on this data. Go to the yield space, Tom. The two year Treasury, the one that's Boom. really uh, tied to uh, short term rates, up 11 basis points just in a couple of ticks here. Uh, the 10 right. years up nine basis points, four point four. And the real so. yield explodes out 10 basis points, a higher inflation adjusted yield, uh, 2.09 percent. I'm taking some time here, folks, so Ira can digest uh, this market moving uh, data curve spread a little bit of disinversion, but the real dynamic is just simply in level. I'm not going to mince words. I said this on Monday. I was just guessing. Now I'm not guessing. We are on the 5% watch for the U.S. full faith and credit two-year yield, 4.87%, rounded up 12 full basis points of movement, the 10-year 446 There's prosaic ideas like what does this do to a 30-year mortgage? is one idea. What does this do to money market funds, Paul? What do we start doing? Is it another half a trillion dollars this week in the money market It's interesting, Tom. I'm just looking at the top live on uh, the reporting on the Bloomberg Terminal. Chris Ancy, senior editor for Bloomberg News, says this is going to really question the feasibility of a June Fed rate cut. That's the bottom line. He's had time to look at it at his studios in Princeton with Bloomberg Intelligence. Ira Jersey, and we'll have Neil Dutta with us in moments as they both digest the data. Ira, I guess I got to go to the Fed chit chat. This is about as no June cut as we've ever seen. Uh, no June cut, and we're going to start pricing out July in a hurry as well here, Tom. So, uh, you know, it, it very likely when you keep on, this was not the worst data, obviously, that we could have seen, right? If 0.5 would have been worse for sure. Um, but it just shows you that the the disinflationary environment is is uh, is lagging now. Um, so, the, you know, the, the idea that we were going to continue to have a right. slow decline of inflation just hasn't happened. And now we're, we're starting to see a leveling off. And because of that, um, it's going to be harder and harder for the Federal Reserve right. to start cutting interest rates, like even make the case that they need to start, start right. cutting interest rates. Um, and, and and calibrate their, right. um, uh, you know, calibrate what they're doing. So, so it wouldn't surprise me at this point if, if the the majority of the market started to price for the first full cut to be in November, at some point in the next couple of uh, next couple of days. Because, um, you know, if they don't cut in July, then then I think that they would just prefer to wait instead of, you know, mm. making a first cut in September. They'll say that they they would every meeting's live, yeah, but quite yeah. frankly, they they've they've never actually cut within a month of the yeah. election. So I suspect that they'll they'll skip September yeah, and, and like- go to uh, November. It's like saying Arsenal Aston Villa is a snooze fest. It's not. It's live. The VIX, 15.70, up 0.72. Dow futures, negative 300. S&P futures, negative 46. Paul, let me lay out the Fed meetings. May 1, June 12, July 31, and the one I've been watching, which is September 18. Forget about the politics. Forget about the election. They're going to have a lot more data yep. into the Q3 season. Yep. Enda Kern uh, from a Bloomberg Economy saying, no surprises here. Shelter and gas prices are fingered by the BLS as the main culprits here in the higher inflation print here. Yeah. So, I mean, Ira, is the Fed just saying, again, we're data dependent. We're seeing a little bit of a, a stickiness here, a little bit of a resurgence here in core inflation. 
So it's okay to wait. Is that kind of how you think they're going to message it? Yeah, I think they almost have to mention it uh, mention it that way. And, you know, we get the minutes today, and, and you're not going to revise the minutes because of, yeah. of this number. But I think as we get into, and you hear some of the Fed speak going into the quiet period before that, that May meeting that Tom just mentioned, um, you know, one of the things that you're going to look at is the shorter term, right? You've heard Governor Waller and as well as other members of the Federal Reserve talk about the the kind of the, mm-hmm. the shorter term momentum of inflation. And when you look at the th- uh, three-month annualized core inflation rate right now, now it's at 4.5 percent. Uh, it was at four percent back yeah. in January, so that's accelerating, right? So that that's not a that's right. not a good sign. Now, granted, seasonally this tends to be a time when inflation's a little bit higher anyway, so you have to take that right. with a little bit of a grain of salt. But it's still moving in the wrong direction, right? And and I think right. that that's one of the keys that you can take away from this report <clears throat> is that yes, people will nuance this and say, oh well, it's housing lagging. There's all these other indicators. Gas prices obviously, uh, you know, feed into at least some of this report today. Right. Um, but nonetheless, like in aggregate, you're still looking at an economy that doesn't have stable well, inflation quite yet. We're going to rip, that's we're gonna gonna rip up the script effect. here. We're with Ira Jersey. He will continue with us. And Neil Dutta will join us in a moment. Commercial free to you across America until the 900 hour with the support of Commonwealth. We thank them for their work with our economics. Commonwealth supporting more than 2,000 independent financial advisors with the solutions they need to grow a thriving business. Commonwealth, go where you grow. Visit Commonwealth.com to learn uh, more. We're thrilled to also tell you scheduled Tracy Alloway and Joe Weisenthal will rip up the script there as well and talk to Mr. Weisenthal and Ms. Alloway about this important inflation report. Dow negative 350, uh, SPX futures at negative 55, the VIX out at 15.87. As Paul mentioned, the two year yield 4.89%, now a 15 basis point higher yield lower price on the two-year uh, yield. Ira Jersey, please, please stay with us if you can. Neil Dutta joins now from Renaissance uh, Macro. Ne- uh, Neil, this goes right to the ambiguity which you think is constructive. If we have a little inflation, I guess we're going to get a little bit of nominal GDP. Does inflation-adjusted GDP get crushed? Are you in like some 2% doom and gloom crew with real GDP? Well, well, I'm not doom and gloom on on, on real growth, but um, you know I think uh, I agree with Ira that um, you know today's inflation number does push out the timing, and I think you know what's important for uh, I think investors to kind of think about here is just how path dependent uh, is 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 that first cut. I mean, um, you know, if it's not July, then are they are they not going to ease right before the election? I mean, how much of that does enters their thinking? It's something to think about. The one thing I would say is that, you know, much of the upside surprise in uh, in the core CPI number this morning was driven by medical care services inflation. And it's important to keep in mind that, you know, there are differences of scope between the CPI data and the PCE data. And the CPI data is running, uh, you know, over a full percentage point higher than PCE. That's about twice, almost three times what's normal. Um, and so, you know, in some respects, I do think the market right. might be overstating how important CPI is for the Fed's reaction function, but uh, you know the, uh, it's a bad number, um, and uh, and and at the margin that pushes the uh, timing out. Paul, to jump in here. Markets deteriorate, negative seventy on SPX futures, Dow futures negative four fifty. And Tom, just on the uh, currency front, dollar yen breaches one fifty two. We're now one five two spot wow. four four. Your yen one six four spot three seven. Yeah. So a little bit yeah. of weakness there. So. Yeah. Uh, um, Neil, where's inflation coming from? I mean, I don't know. I, I, I guess we always thought that this, you know, last hundred basis points or so of, of reducing inflation would probably be the toughest. Where are we seeing inflation these days? Well, you're seeing it. Uh, I mean, you're seeing it in motor vehicle insurance. Uh, that was a big driver for inflation uh, last month. You also saw it in apparel. Um, so apparel prices ro- rose quite sharply. Um, you know, keep in mind, though, I mean, what I would just say is that you look at apparel prices, they rose, I think, seven tenths of one percent in March, and that's following a big increase in February. But taking a step back, people are already making a um, a trade off. Right. So if you look at real consumption of clothing, it's already declining. So in some respects, that is not the kind of inflation the Fed should be worried about. I mean, you that's not demand driven inflation. If people are cutting back in the areas that are going up in price, um, 
that's uh, that suggests that people are making a, a trade off already, and they're somewhat resistant to higher prices, which then raises the question about how right. long those price increases can stick. Um, you know, motor vehicle insurance. Uh, you know, it was going in the right direction. It was still very elevated, but it was going in the right direction for the last few months, and now it's right. reversing. Um, you know, but we did see things like car prices come down. So I'm not really sure well, what to make of that. I mean, ultimately, if the underlying value of the asset itself, which is cars, right. is going down in price, you'd expect uh, you know the uh, the insurance cost. Okay, I want to go to Ira right now, and then Neil Dutta with the same question. We're going to go mathy here because Dutta won't uh -oh. come on unless we go mathy. <laughs> Ira, it's real simple. The ten year real yield is now out over two standard deviations up to 2.09%. It did it in February, Valentine's Day, when we all had to buy Lisa chocolate, killed us. And then from December, it's been a lift from 1.70 up to 2.09. Ira Jersey, are we at a critical point for the real yield? Um, I, I don't think so. You, you know, the, the real yield is a, 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 so to the way that we look at the real yield, it basically two components uh, describe most of, of why we're pricing where we are two percent ish for uh, for 10 year real yield. So first is just volatility in the market. Right. So you, you're going to do when when the market volatility is high, you're going to demand a higher real right, yield, number right. one. And, and then secondly, and I think that this is important and one of the reasons you're seeing the big sell off today there um, and that's monetary policy. So so, you know, if 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 the difference between the, the Fed funds rate and uh, and and CPI or PC whatever inflation measure you have uh, you, you want to use is is relatively high then then certainly uh, you know tips yields you have to price that in as well so 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 those two factors tend to tend to drive this and the, the fact that now that the market's starting to price out some of the early cuts and starting to price out right. some um, you know that terminal floor that we were talking about earlier um, now the terminal rate floor is moving right. up as well you'd expect to see somewhat higher real okay. yields and, and you're seeing that now. Neil, I it, it's not. I mean, yeah. it's not unattractive, quite frankly, Tom. You know, two percent, uh, two percent plus inflation um, is is an interesting. I, I think is right. are interesting levels to to think about uh, for for tips versus uh, versus nominal treasuries. Neil, Neil Dutt, I look at the five year inflation adjusted yield, and we're back to a November almost pre Thanksgiving uh, pricing here, four point five three percent. What does a four point five three percent five year real yield do to American business? Um, I mean, I think at the margin, it, you know, I mean, obviously it raises the cost of financing. I think what it does, I think it, 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 you know, frankly, what it makes look more ridiculous is the Fed's longer run expectations for where neutral rates are. I mean, clearly, um, you know, this is an economy that can still work at high rates um, yeah. at, or at these rates. I mean, I think that much is clear. Um, but, uh, you know, I think what it does suggest is that, um, you know, the Fed's expectations for, for where neutral uh will be is, is just frankly too low. Um, and I think, you know, every month that goes by where we get an, a combination of strong jobs growth and higher inflation, I mean, I think that that kind of basically cements that case. Boy, I'm looking at just a couple of categories here, Tom. Car Please. insurance was up 22% from a year well, ago. Let's stop, let's I have no idea show. what's let's going on there. Let's stop the show right now. I mean, I'm sorry, this is a fixed cost. Yeah. Can I say that, Paul? I think so, yeah. I gotta pay it every every month. So, I, mean, I mean, I know you don't, you know, you've got the Bentley and everything, but Neil, for those of us yeah, that drive. Yeah, but Neil Dutta, I mean, car, you say car insurance, except that's like breathing air. You have to pay car insurance, right? Uh, you have to pay it. I mean, but as I say, I mean, it's 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 interesting. Because it's, it's interesting because it hasn't moderated yet. When you look, I mean, ultimately, these things should follow the underlying value. I mean, what are you insuring, right? You're insuring a car. What do we know about the price of cars? The price of cars is actually going down. That's why core commodity CPI in this number was, uh, you know, on the softer side. Um, so, you know, there is, um, you know, there is some of that going on. I mean, it could just be timing. Um, but, you know, you have to take these numbers as they come to you, given the uncertainty the Fed's been talking about. And I think, um, you know, at the margin, that kind of it should push them to err on the side yeah. of waiting. Hey, Ira, you know, looking at the 10 year Treasury here, we're up uh, almost 14 basis points, pushing up 4.50. You know, I I know nothing about the bond market, and I, and I say that proudly. Um, four to four and a half percent was kind of my range for the 10 year. Do I have to rethink that? 
Uh, well, four, 451 is a very important technical level uh, on the charts. We've been highlighting that level now for, for about 10 days. Um, you, you break there, and, and we can certainly get back toward 4.7% uh, pretty quickly. Wow. Um, I, I would like to, to say something uh, and just comment on something that Neil just said, and, and that's that higher terminal, uh, the, the terminal floor, right? So the idea that, you know, 2.5% is no longer the um, kind of the base case. I, I think there's, there's a recency bias that a lot of investors have, and certainly members of the Federal Reserve and the Fed staff have, and that's that. You know, we we've come down, and and that the uh, that terminal rates that that the that our star is basically much lower than it was, say, in the 1990s or 1980s or 70s. Um, you know, I don't think we're going back to the 1970s or 80s, but certainly, um, you know, our star, the the real funds rate, so the real neutral rate, has to be higher than it was. Uh, you know, prior to um, prior to the, to COVID, because because there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of structural issues that have shifted pretty significantly since COVID. We've talked about all of them, right? Whether it's immigration, right. work from home, like there's a whole bunch of things that, to think about that way. Um, but but the idea that, that our star and, and that the real rate is higher, I think is something that's that's underappreciated um, by a lot of policymakers. Right. And I think that, that that's going to take some time for them to right. get it into their psychology that yes, you know, maybe 3% right. is the new 2%. Uh, one final question, you guys. We've got to go to our other esteemed guests here. Neil Dodd, as simple as I can, is America oppressed by inflation now? Uh, I wouldn't say that America is oppressed by inflation. I mean, if you ask, um, if you ask consumers uh, about their short-run inflation expectations, they've actually been going down, even though we've been seeing these upside surprises on inflation. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, so I, I think... That, to me, that disconnect, frankly, is quite interesting. The fact that inflation expectations have been moderating. I mean, we just saw that this week with the New York Fed right. uh, consumer expectations data. Um, I think that, to me, is one reason why I'm a little bit skeptical that what we're seeing so far this year is kind of the underlying trend for where inflation is. Um, but the data are what the data are, as I mentioned. But you always have to kind of go back to first principles, Tom. I mean, ultimately, um, unit labor costs are, are, are we, I mean, where is the inflation really, um, you know, coming from? You have to start worrying about it, you know, at some point soon, uh, if inflation continues to surprise in this fashion, you have to worry a little bit about, uh, you know, declines in real wage growth weighing on consumer spending at right. some point later. So I do think that that's something that should begin to uh, enter right. the, the conversation if this continues. Somebody just sent in a live chat YouTube. Uh, what am I going to be looking at? I'm going to look at Jason Furman up at Harvard, who does a wonderful annualized inflation series. I'm sure I'll get that out on Twitter here in a moment. Futures negative 64, Dow futures at negative 400. Thank you, Ira Jersey of Bloomberg Intelligence. Thank you, Neil Dutta of Renaissance Macro with a real market moving uh, report today. We are fortunate in that we're going to talk about their show. Odd Lots is just ginormous. Apple Podcasts is where you see it. And, you know, you look, you got a chartable, you know, and there's the Joe and Tracy, the Tracy and Joe show and yep. all that. We'll talk about Odd Lots, but we're going to open up the conversation with Tracy Alloway and Joseph Weisenthal here just about inflation. Tracy, where are you seeing inflation? We've been making jokes about it, except it's not funny. Well, my personal basket of inflation is all mayonnaise, so that's how <laughs> I measure it. I haven't looked it up the um, the component change in the in the Mayo index just yet this morning, but I plan to right after this interview. Look, I think most of the unexpected rise seems to have come out of um, shelter costs and gasoline, or at least that's what the BLS said. I think the really interesting thing here is, right. and uh, Neil and and Ira were kind of touching on this. You know, we can talk about the neutral rate, R star, the natural rate of interest, all we want. But the inflation data doesn't seem to be bearing out um, that entire thesis. And in fact, I thought it was really interesting last week. It kind of flew under the radar. But the Bank for International Settlements published a paper where they basically said, like, our star's kind of useless and we should probably <laughs> oh, really? just be looking at observed inflation yeah. instead of trying Thank to you. observe this unknowable that's, that's, neutral rate. That's called the gospel according to Tom Keen. Joe, what's your insight here right now? I yeah. mean, inflation's oppressive. I just quoted Argentina with 276% annual inflation. That's oppressive. That's Are oppressive. Are we oppressed? Well, um, we still have real wage growth. 
as uh, Neil was talking about, as Neil mentioned, uh, even consumers' own expectations for inflation via various surveys have come down. So I think there's an argument that we're not being pressed, oppressed by inflation. It's still bad. You know, there's two things that I'm thinking about, which is that um, there is this view among many, the sort of Powell, Waller, Bullard camp, I would say, that um, policy is tight right now. And on some level, you and this goes to Tracy's point about the unknowability of neutral, it's like, if inflation keeps surprising to the upside and maybe accelerating a little bit since the last yep, year, yep. what do these words tight even mean um, in the context of the observed reality that inflation is drifting up? The other thing I keep thinking about, you know, we have futures down today. Currently, S&P futures down 1.2 percent. The story, <laughs> the story of 2024 has been hotter than expected inflation prints and a red hot stock market nonetheless. Yep. So in the short term, yes, this is certainly a bump. But it has been interesting that those that first cut keeps getting priced out further and further into the future. Now just 50 cuts, 50 basis points priced in. And by and large, the stock market by any outside of today still doing phenomenally well. Exactly. And Tracy, I'm just looking at, you know, for context, seeing Bloomberg reporting here, shelter and gas combined contributed over half of the overall monthly increase. That's kind of what people feel month to month, yeah. day to day. This is a, yeah. a, a, a you know. I, don't, I was just, I put it in our internal chat. This is a problem for President Joe Biden. I mean, he, inflation, you don't want to see that thing coming back. Well, I guess there's two th things we're kind of learning here, which is one, a lot more people seem to care about how much things cost yep. than the actual employment rate, right? Like the number of people buying stuff is just always going to be bigger than the number of people who are actually unemployed. So I think, you know, it's great yeah. that the Fed can go out and say, well, the labor, you know, the unemployment rate is at decades low, but the thing people see the most in their day-to-day -day lives is the grocery price or the price of gas or whatever. So that's one thing. And then the other thing I would say is, uh, you know, I, I think Biden has been tackling this issue in some new and slightly innovative ways, including talking about price gouging, talking about profit margins. And again, the rate of inflation on the stuff that is a daily need for people is where we see the most impact, right? So uh, people have to buy food, they have to gas up their cars, whatever. They don't have a lot of like you, competition in that I mean, market. Paul and I don't have a real life. We don't travel. You guys are like jetting around. <laughs> yeah. they, you know, they're yeah. the, the golf stream and usual. The rest of the country, are they in, I guess Arkansas, or Texas, are they in disinflation while we're oppressed here in New York? I mean, I don't think so. I mean, I, I don't think so at all. You I think can see the regional CPI numbers. Yeah, and I don't think uh, there is some pocket right. of the country that's escaping it. And in fact, I think in a lot of these markets, um, you see hotter than expected inflation, <clears throat> in part because there's just like been so much rapid right. growth and so much strain on the local resources <clears throat> due to the influx okay. of population, which kind of maybe negates other advantages. Yeah, I got to talk about odd lots or when they put in the timeout chair, their handlers, they get upset. Yeah, you know, our rider. You, you go off go off the thing. I mean, if you're in Calverton, New York, out by the Hamptons on a given weekend, and you got to figure out what to do with the acreage, oh, yeah. you weigh in with a tractor supply, Cub Cadet, 54-inch, 24 horsepower, riding lawnmower. That's what you do. Tracy is too. You, do, you guys talk to, well, she's got the man's mode out for the dog. I mean, the yep, dog, yeah. you know, the dog needs exercise. But what did you learn? I mean, this is like a classic odd lots. Yeah. You're talking to tractor supply. What'd you learn? So we had the CEO uh, out tomorrow, uh, comes out tomorrow, and we're going to learn why Tracy keeps having to spend more and more money. On <laughs> I am the modal so tractor supply she, customer. <laughs> but the other interesting, the really interesting thing economically with them, and it even speaks to what you were talking about with uh, Texas and Arkansas, all that is that there are some COVID booms that happened and then reversed yeah. Peloton, Zoom, et cetera, and then we sort of went back to normal. This move out of uh, the cities has not really negated. And people are moving agree. further and further yeah. and further apart. This was not just a one-off shock. And so it benefits their sort of strategy, which they sort of proudly say, we don't have anything near New York, but we have three stores near Odessa, Texas. I, I, Paul, <laughs> Paul, you're living this, and, and Joe and Tracy, I don't have a life. But the bottom line is, Joe is 100%. I saw it just today with the eclipse, Monday, Tuesday, into this Wednesday, I'm sorry, they're out in Calverton or up the Hudson <laughs> River. I know, I know. I mean, that's all there is to it. You guys also had a recent uh, uh, interview with about U.S.-Mexico freight. I got to think that is a great 
mm. growth story. I think about the uh, with the Canadian Pacific bought that railroad. Now they can go from Canada yep. all the way down to Mexico. Yeah. So we spoke with Matt Silver, who's the co-founder of uh, this new company, which is building technology basically to facilitate cross-border trade between the U.S. and Mexico. And he's been talking about how it's booming. You know, there was always auto production, yep. manufacturing in Mexico, it's but different. that's really picked up. Yeah. And the one, the point that he made, which seems kind of obvious, but I guess I hadn't internalized it, was the idea of Mexico having a competitive advantage just because of its geographic location next to the U.S. and the fact that it's in the same time zone. Yeah. You can go down to Mexico, drink tequila with a potential business no. partner, and fly back to the U.S. <clears throat> in a day, right? Try or doing that with China. One of the two. Yeah, that too. You need okay. recovery built in. Yeah, recovery built in. <laughs> Guys, thank you. Thank you. Odd Lots, out on Apple Podcasts. I'm spending a lot of time looking at the podcasts, and Odd Lots leading the way for Bloomberg with some intelligent conversations. I'm really interested in tractor uh, supply <laughs> as Tracy looks at the Cub Cadet. You got to go, Tom. They have series. the baby chickens right now. They're very cute. Oh, good. That, <laughs> yes. that would be good. Yeah. The baby chickens with vet bill and uh, kennel feed. That would just be... <laughs> Uh, the, I can't imagine. Steven Rusciuto, we're like, yeah, Rusciuto, econ, we're econed out, except, wow, what a report with Mizuho. Good morning, sir. Did you expect this? We're not as bad as these numbers, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. um, the reality is, though, we have been in the camp that basically the data was going to keep the Federal Reserve from doing <clears throat> what the Fed wanted to do, right. uh, which is cut interest rates, and that the economy fundamentally is healthier than a lot of people anticipate. Not surprised by it in that regard, but surprised on the month-over-month -month changes. What yes. about fixed inflation costs at the Eccles building when they sit around the table? Are they going to talk about, we have to eat? We have to pay car insurance. We have to pay rent or a mortgage averaging out now at whatever it is, five, six percent up to the seven point three percent. Do they talk about required inflation costs versus luxury inflation? Well, they really should, because at the end of the day, they're trying to maximize social welfare. And their concept between, behind keeping the labor market as tight as it is, is to try to drive up wages. The problem is by keeping the labor market tight in an environment where all the excess capacity has been used up in the system, is it creates inflation. And that's when you get into the situation, as you indicated a few seconds ago, in terms of negative real wages. So your attempt to try to cr maximize social welfare by keeping a labor market tight could go against you if CEOs and companies feel they have pricing power. And after seeing this kind of improvement in the in the data, you're starting to see that again, and that's a broad based improvement in the inflation numbers or, or rise in the inflation numbers is telling you that more and more people feel they do have some pricing power left. And that's why it's it's working at the detriment of their desire to uh, maximize social welfare. So, Steve, I, I think the initial round of inflation that we saw from the pandemic, a lot of folks said, hey, this is supply side driven. It'll play out. Is that still the case? Do well, you think? It, it did play out. It and the reason out. why, I mean, you hear people all the time, well, inflation was up at 9%. Now it's at 3 All of this is happening because of the Fed. It's not happening for the Fed. It was happening as a result of the supply side and the <clears> fact <throat> that even though monetary pol fiscal policy is still very, very accommodative, it's not as accommodative as it was. Yep. So between those two factors, you've taken inflation down to the 3-plus percentage points. Getting it from 3 to 2 is a very different story. This is where the Fed has to get involved. And the Fed has been telling you over and over again, we want to cut rates. And it's been damaging their ability to create a better inflationary environment. When you see inflation at maybe just the last three months ticking up a little bit, does that change your economic outlook as it relates to the consumer and the retail sales and all these types of things that probably go into your GDP model? Well, I mean, it, it reflects more what we've been saying. We've been in the camp that the labor market is tight and the Fed's not going to achieve its inflation target. So at some point, you know, the Fed either just walks away from its inflation target, okay. which is a risk, but then that implies higher long-term interest rates. Uh, and that goes against the desire of the same people who want to cut rates because they want to see lower mortgage rates. They want to see people be able to afford to buy homes. And therefore, they get themselves into this catch-22, and they haven't been able to get themselves out of it because the economy is fundamentally healthy. And now, the, just looking at the WIRP function, pushing out maybe only 50, rate, uh, 50 basis points for the entire year this year. And, and that big contrast to how we started the year with a lot more cuts factored into the market. Does the Fed wait till September? I don't know. 
Well, they, they certainly have another opportunity in June when they redo yep. the dots again. I mean, my personal preference would be that next year when they do the uh, review of monetary policy, they eliminate the dots. I think right. the dots create well, We have more a function on the Bloomberg them. terminal. Dots go. Yes, I know. <laughs> I, I, I think that Can creates go? more problems. I would, say, I would say with great respect to Mr. Bloomberg, can the dots go, go away? Right. Yes, exactly. please go away. Okay, thank you, um, Steve. And, and I think that would be a, a positive step in, yeah. in the right direction for them. But, you know, until we get that, I think you're probably waiting to June. I don't think yeah. you'll get any real messaging coming right. out from the May FOMC meeting. I want to go political here, which is not, you know, it's not that you're not comfortable with that. You, you, Steve, you're so able that you can answer this beautifully. I'm sorry, but inflation is the haves and the have-nots. The president's got to address this. This is now one, two, three months of persistent inflation. But to me, there's a great separation in America. For example, Paul, and I'm thinking of the great Barry Hinckley from the, the iconic Hinckley uh, ship family. He's trotting out Martha Stewart's Skylands 2 Hinckley picnic boat. Picnic and because boat. he's helping Martha slide into a Hinkley picnic boat, and this is popping like 1.72 million. This is a wow. You they know, look nice, though. This is like gorgeous. This is you know, Purcelli takes us down the Hudson River to go over to Pigeon. Okay. You know, Steve Rusciuto. I'm sorry. There's a haves and have-nots to inflation. The fancy people that have Hinkley picnic boats, they're not worried about this report, are they? No, uh, you, but you're right. There is a real difference, and this comes down to the maximized social welfare. The people that they supposedly say they want to help, they're not helping with the policies they're creating. And that's the underlying problem for this administration. They have loaded the Federal Reserve with a bunch of doves, and those doves really want to cut interest rates in an environment where the economy is telling them you shouldn't be cutting interest rates. Uh, and then there's this academic environment that you get from a lot of Wall Street economists which say, well, rates are just naturally too high. I wish they would just come down and normalize. People don't know what normal is. Yeah, but Steve, the, those academic economists and the market economists are people that either have, want, or aspire to a Hinkley picnic boat. Yes, they do. They're not our listeners out there living this. You're 100% correct, and this is why the, the mistakes the Fed are making is basically allowing this economy to stay right. too, high, that high, too tight or too hot, that you are actually creating pricing power for corporate America, right. which then wants to create double-digit returns. And that double-digit yeah. returns is what then drives up equity prices. Now, equities are having a hit in here, but let's be honest, they had a hell of a great run in the yeah. first quarter of the you year. You know, Martha Stewart's picnic boat is Skylands 2. Do you know what mine would be? Dramamine. Dramamine. It would be Dramamine <laughs> exactly. on the back. Stephen Rusciuto, thank you so much. Barry Hinckley and Martha Stewart, thank you so much as well for giving us inflation perspective. Lisa Mateo report bonds. Lisa Mateo, the, there was almost too many choices this morning. There's there? a lot. There's a lot going on. There were some good stories. This one, I, I have to ask you guys a question. If you're traveling on a plane, have you ever been asked to change your oh, seat? Sure. You have. Yeah. And this is the way I think about it. When I, having four kids yeah. traveling back and forth to San Francisco for 25 years, many times we asked people to kind of help us out and switch seats so we could be together. So now I'm on the flip side of that. Mm. And I try to be as accommodating as I can. But if somebody asked me to move from my aisle seat, which is my preference, yes. to like a middle seat, not happening. Not happening. I don't care. Isn't Even if there's kids the involved. Here yes. is <laughs> somebody in economy who has an aisle seat often is paying extra for it. And that, that's this, the nuance. This is, this is the problem it's because people are paying extra for seats now, right? Passengers are paying more for seats and then they don't want to pay more. So they just yeah. choose the option to just go wherever. But then when they get on the plane in the cabin, I, they're starting to ask other people, you know what? I, Let I me just switch with you. I just sent afterthought to Edinburgh. Okay, sure, it not? was outrageous. It was like I thought it'd be seven hundred bucks, and it was twelve, thirteen hundred bucks. And one of the overlays was aisle seat or yep. window seat. Okay. And the second overlay was oxygen. And I said, <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll pay up for oxygen. <laughs> yep. As well. But but is the answer but people are being rude now and not? It's saying, the answer you know? is that it's it's causing a lot of tension in the cabin, and there's yeah. so much tension in travel to begin with. So the Wall Street Journal has a really good look into this because you have the passenger who's asking, and they're right. like looked at as like a cheapskate. Then you have the person sitting in the seat who's looked at uh, like a jerk if they don't change the seat, and then you have the airline pe stewardesses who are caught in the middle, yep. and they just want to sit there and say, 
not my problem. Yep. <laughs> it's exactly. up to you guys. You battle Next. it out. All right. Uh, theater owners, they're saying that blockbusters are not enough to help them survive. They like the Barbenheimer, you know, that whole trend of it. But they need more than two movies right. to survive. Paul, start there. Is yep. that a one-off? Was Barbenheimer like just one lovely summer? Uh, no. I mean, there's a lot of stuff. 24 yeah. is going to be, the summer of 24 is going to be okay. 25 and 26 are going to okay. be blockbusters. Continually. Yeah, yeah. no, and it's a problem right. because you've had like, you know, big hits like Barbenheimer, but then you had the sleeper hits. You had the Five Nights in Freddy's. You've had that one. Five Nights. I love that. You didn't see the Five Nights times. in Freddy? <laughs> I saw that one. <laughs> but it made so much money. It was a sleeper hit. Then you have the Taylor Swift, the Beyonce concert films trying to pump in money. But then you have the Hollywood strikes also that hurt. You have a competition from yep. streaming, and that's another issue that the theaters are dealing with. So we'll see where it goes. But do, do we still have movies that do like a hundred million? Yes. Yes. Yeah. They're still blockbusters. Sure. Yeah. Well, a blockbuster today really has to be like a billion global. Yeah. Global, global, and it's okay. tough. The superhero ones, not as, not as much of a moneymaker okay. as they used to be. Interesting. I haven't been to the theater since time began. Oh no! <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, I it's you just have some to great theaters. Go in support. Manhattan. Manhattan's got yeah. some great big old yeah. theaters it, with what, great what stuff. What I remember, I know we got to continue here, but I remember when the kids went all the time. Yes. And then one day they just stopped, and it was because of streaming and Netflix. Yep. They just stopped going. It's more convenient. Next, what do you got? Uh, track and field. This one interesting from oh, the track. Associated Press. For me, track. right? With all the track and field <laughs> track I'm doing. Track and field is going to become the first sport to introduce prize money at the Olympics. So World Athletics, they're the governing body of, the, of, of athletics. They say they're going to pay $50,000 to gold medalists in Paris. Um, it comes from this big pot of $2.4 million they're setting aside to pay them. There's 48 events in track and field, so that's how it's going to break down. If you're on a relay team, you have to break up the $50,000. But it's the start of something new, paying these athletes who win the top. Wow. Oh, they were amateur. Isn't that break the whole amateur thing? Correct, but need a little cashish, you know, to go along with it. <laughs> All, right. <laughs> so, All right. And there's more to come. They're actually thinking of payments for silver and bronze medalists. They're planned to start from the 2028 wow. Olympics in Los Angeles. Angeles. Wow. I mean, to me, I've been reading uh, Le Monde English. I really recommend it, folks. The Le Monde, the great French newspaper. And they have a very inexpensive all English site, which I find fascinating. And of course, there's no other debate. Are they going to get in the river and swim? Ooh. So what do you do? Got to pay somebody 10,000 <laughs> bucks to get in the river? Exactly. It's, not, it's not pretty. No. I, I mean, it's not, you know, at some point as we get closer, we'll get well, the But you've crazy. got the suite all set up in, in Paris for the Olympics. Right? We do. You okay. know, we're on the backside away from the street. Okay. And, you know, we're looking out on the, they got the, the cigar, um, you know, garden, the yep. Jardin. Sure. Jardin. The Jardin. Okay. Olivia. Okay. V or X or whatever, Jardin <laughs> Cigar Bar. All right. But, you know, we're we'll be all set up yeah, for the summer. You know, Greifeld's going to be out with Gus and the horses. Yep. Extra. She's yeah, taking exactly. Gus the horse, <laughs> and they're hanging out. I think it's out by Versailles. It's okay. very exciting. <laughs> Next. Finally, if this, we don't want to hear this on the early morning shift when we come in, but decaf becoming the hottest thing in coffee right now. Oh, you know, That's you have alcohol-free cocktails, you no have meat-free hamburgers, so now decaf okay. is becoming the new thing. Uh, the reason why is because new techniques in caffeine removal, they've started without using chemicals, so it's becoming a little bit healthier, I okay. guess, to make, for, for I decaf. I wonder what percentage of people but, drink reg I Caffeinated coffee versus decaf. I don't know the percentage there. It's not, but it's becoming this high thing because there's different competitions, like these high-class competitions. And decaf was actually won a top prize for the first time in like this competition's 20-year really? history. So it, it's well, starting to, to, to pick up a little I mean, bit. You guys, I mean, the Tang here, and folks, I've been using Tang Zero. You know, the sugar became a problem, and Tang Zero is great. But you guys deserve to walk by the decaf excellence of Senka. Oh, so, yeah. Oh, Sanka. Sanka was the sight to behold. The, the, the instant Sanka. coffee, too? Yeah. I assume Sanka is still around. Lisa, oh. thanks so much. Great. That, that is Lisa Mateo yep. with the newspapers. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast, bringing you the best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. You can also watch the show live on YouTube. Visit the Bloomberg Podcast channel on YouTube to see the show weekday mornings from 7 to 10 a.m. Eastern from our global headquarters in New York City. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen. And always on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business App.